This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Cooking With Grief, the comedy podcast where we talk about weird facts from around the world and try and make you laugh whilst we do it. I'm Chris and as always I'm joined by my co-host Chris. Greetings. That's you. What what a how are you? I, I'm well. What a I don't want to say subdued, but it that was a very like uh, cons- succinct. Yeah, succinct intro. I feel well. Yeah, it, it's it's weirdly thrown me more than if you'd waffled. Well, okay, so that actually works quite well. I mean, I've just ruined it. But <laughs> nice segue. <laughs> the the reason why uh, this is a bit of a um, subdued intro is because both myself and you have been away for a week so we sort of we need to rekindle the spark between us is uh well i was got also i've just been a bit ill for the last few days so you know i apologize if I, if you hear some uh coughing spluttering and then a thump as i thought <laughs> <the chair. laughs> please just carry on i feel like it feels like it's been a while like i feel like we've got a lot to catch up on I, I didn't know the spark had gone between us so soon. I mean, admittedly, you you went off around the world with your girlfriend and not me, your loyal co-host. Well, yeah, that's unfortunately how things go sometimes. How many episodes has she co-hosted? Zero. Yeah, that's a fa- that's a fair point. So you you've been uh, traveling around uh, the old USA. Did the uh, the northeast ish? So um, what I would have liked to have done is get a higher car and uh, you know see some of the sort of. Um, you know, like rural towns, mm. yeah. Whatever. You know, like the things you see in films where, like, say, like you know, these towns where there's a diner, a gas station, and then like out of town, it's like a forest full of bears. You know, the type of place where, like, you see in films where, like, there'll be a guy in a diner and he'll pay and they'll go out and his car will have like a dead deer like strapped to the roof because he's just been hunting. Yeah, yeah. Somewhere, somewhere like that. You did, oh, and you everyone did, you wears like flannel, in, like in urban. Um, no, I didn't get that in Manhattan. <laughs> no, unfortunately. Ah. But um, the reason we didn't is because I think it was COVID rather than the war. Something happened anyway. Basically, it's called Chip Again. All the silicon in the world's gone or hard to get, and chips, microchips are hard to make, which means cars are harder to build and take longer. Which means the higher car industry doesn't have a supply. Which means they started charging through the nose. Which meant we got the train. All right, which is so, good, but tends to go to urban centres. Yeah, yeah. So, so they went train or plane. So, so you went uh, New York, Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, Chicago. The big three, which were all, all fine cities. I, I enjoyed all three of them. Um, again, this is the problem. Like, I know all three have like rough reputations, especially like. Like Chicago, for example, I know is like plagued with gun violence and stuff. And to be fair, it was weird seeing loads of signs with no handgun logos on the door, like Subway or McDonald's or whatever. And there's like mm. a little no handgun sign. You're like, don't normally need to like. <laughs> normally, that's just a given. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. No, no but, bazookas, no grenades. You know. Yeah. No, I found like the cent. Obviously, I only saw the center because, like, say, that's what you get when you sort of go on holiday and you get the train in and whatever. But they were all um, really nice, really nice cities, I thought. Especially, like, the centre of Chicago. Like I say, I know it's got a really bad rep for, like, the outskirts or whatever. I don't, like I said, I didn't see any of that. Chicago, uh, centre of it, very, like... All right, I'm just going to say, it's going to sound stupid, but, you know, like, shiny. Mm. Like, <laughs> yeah. everything was neat. Everything yeah. was neat. Everything was clean. Everything was, like, grand. Mm. It's just, like, <laughs> this is just a very shiny, like... Thing. I'm sure, like, once you go, like, a few stop a few stops on the uh, the L train the, uh, the old local lingo there <laughs> yeah. um, I bet you if you go like out to a bit all of a sudden it turns into like like a drug fueled like bullet ridden hellhole or something from the stereotype but no very impressed by all of all three was it as breezy as advertised it was quite windy on one of the days ah. also it's just weird it literally has a beach well, several beaches. Really? But then, like, there's a skyscraper. Yeah, because it's on the bank. And this is what I learned, actually, whilst I was there. So it's on the banks of Lake Michigan. Mm-hmm. Um, but what, like, 
mean makes it have all these beaches is when the city was founded they enshrined in law that the water's edge would always be public land and oh so, nice and i think in the past there have been a few attempts to uh to sort of circumvent that but like they were always not back you know like back in like victorian times you know when industrialists sort of like they were all of a sudden super much richer than everyone else and they were like i can do what i want <laughs> But they, were, yeah, they were always rebuffed, and uh, so no, it was uh, nice. Like you say, you can sit on the beach and uh, with a skyscraper behind you, which is oh. weird. Yeah. It's- also, what it's also weird, just as a Brit, is the scale, especially of New York, but Chicago and Philly as well. Well, yeah, New York by f- like massively, Chicago not far behind, and then Philadelphia like behind a bit, but still. The scale of the buildings. It's going to sound weird, right? Because everyone knows they're full of skyscrapers. But it's the it's the skyscrapers that don't even look that tall in comparison. But when you're at the bottom of it, you're like, holy shit. Like, basically, in Manhattan, you could drop the Shard, which for people who don't know, is the tallest building in London. I think it's one of the tallest in Western Europe as well. It's 300 metres, about 1,000 foot tall. In London, it dominates the skyline. It's huge. You could drop it in the in Midtown Manhattan, and you wouldn't even notice it was there. Like it wouldn't peek up out the tops of the buildings or anything. Wow! It would just blend into the average height. It's insane. And like, like I say, you sort of you're used to the idea. Well, I was anyway. You know, like that. There's some very tall building. Like the Empire State Building is obviously like a very tall building, but it's all the really tall buildings that aren't even considered interesting because they're not that tall, that would dwarf any sort of British city. Mm. Like, Manchester is the um, sort of second most high rise city in England. You know, like, and I've it, seen... Like, it, it would feel few, like, quaint. References. Oh, yeah, it wouldn't even, like... It, it would be the small part of... It would be the low rises. Yeah. Like, and like I said, it's the fact that they're also, like, so close together as well, so there's just these corridors of giant buildings... And it's like, so does I don't it, know, does there's it just something overawing about it. In a way, I wouldn't say claustrophobic, um, because the streets are still quite wide. But, yeah, in a way, it sort of creates these, like, canyons and valleys of skyscrapers and, like, yeah, like, shadow or whatever. So, yeah, no, in, in a way, it is. Like I say, it's like a similar vibe, because Manchester is used as, again, here's a fact for people... Is Manchester sometimes used as a filming location in like, you know, so for example, in Captain America, when they needed to um, have a New York thing, Manchester's used as a stand-in because like, it's architecturally similar, but much, much, much cheaper to shut down <laughs> for <Yeah. laughs> a couple of days if you're filming. Um, it's because I think both cities developed around the same time, you know, like industrial revolution to, there wasn't much pre-industrial architecture there ever so they're quite similar it feels very similar times a million mm. you know, like the feeling you get when like again this is a quite a niche reference but like there's a bit in the uh manchester the northern quarter where it's like old brick buildings like mm. there's a similar bit hell's kitchen in uh New York felt similar with the um, you know the classic fire escapes on the outside, like similar thing. Only every building has like an extra, f- and these are just low rise like apartment buildings with shops at the bottom, like nothing special. But even then, they all have seem to have like an extra two or three stories on top. Yeah, it was just sort of over overawing in a way, like in a way that you just sort of and like, I just felt like New York even makes London look like London's busy. But and I've always said this actually, like when you reach a certain level of busyness, it doesn't really matter. Like it sort of becomes almost a moot point. Like you can go to some fairly small towns and cities, and it but if they're rammed, like oh, it's like going to a football match. If you go to a football match, it's busy, and you're, you you know, there's crowds of people. It doesn't matter if you go to somewhere that has thirty thousand fans versus if you go to Wembley for a cup final and there's ninety thousand fans. When you're in the middle of the crowd, all you think of this is busy. Yeah. Like, you can't, it gets beyond the point where you can't. Yeah. So, like, 
it's true like of that but I still feel like even London feels almost like um, I don't know not less uh, busy but less I don't know it's just it's yeah, less the, chaotic the, yeah, the, and less the, like the dials turned down yeah just that it just doesn't bit. scale the same way but the one thing I will say about New York nobody can drive oh really like all they do well because again even though like I say the roads aren't that narrow but and they're all built on built on a sen- nice sensible grid system but like it's still well too busy yet people everyone seems to insist on driving those massive American SUVs which again for sort of just a comparison they do like when you look at a Range Rover in Britain you're like oh wow that's big yeah. Whereas if you look at a Range Rover in America and it's parked next to an Escalade, the Escalade, like Cadillac Escalades or something like another meter longer. <laughs> like they oh, just wow. have those bits stick, you know. And and you sort of think they're just on, on, unless I, unless you're scaling a mountain, you do not need a car that size. Yeah. And like yeah, they look cool and all that. I'm sure it's great to have that amount of space, but they're too big to turn around <laughs> these corners very yeah. well. Yeah. I know this is a gross stereotype, but like it's a known thing that like the American driving lessons or driving license thing, I know it varies by state and whatnot, but like I think like it's been found that like theirs is much easier to pass than like most of Europe's um driving tests. Like the amount of um road work you have to have done to you know, hours on the road to pra- pass is much less in America than in the UK and Europe. So, like, I don't think they're necessarily that great at driving anyway. But it's fine in most of America because you've got all this, you know, million miles of space. Like, the roads are huge. Whereas here, they're quite small. So everyone, like, whenever they seem to turn, they always seem to, like, swerve out of the lane they're in because this car has a turning circle, the, like, the same turning circle as, like... <laughs> An articulated lorry. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say one of those ships that goes down the Panama Canal. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, like, you start turning like, and then in three days you'll you'll veer right. Yeah. So then they swing out of the lane they're in. Then everyone's just honking. So it's just constant honking because nobody can just turn around the corner. Nobody can just do a right turn, <laughs> like, normally. They just end up, like, cutting across two lanes. And also, it's dead weird. Even though they've got, like, traffic lights at every junction, they also have um, cops doing the traffic, which part of me wonders, like, A, if they... Well, I'm in two minds. Either A, it shows that, like, they need it because, you know, can't drive and everyone's just honking all the time. But then part of me wonders if it just ends up overcomplicating things. Because if you've got a light telling you to do one thing... And a cop telling you to do something else is like, do I do I go? Do I stay? Like the cops <laughs> yeah. waving me. The lights on red, but the cops waving me to go. It's like, do I do I, which which one? I'm in a bind here. Whose authority do I come to? The, the machine or the man? I don't know. And there was one who was like really like he got really wound up because the guy wasn't looking, and then he's like started staring at him, doing you know the whole you know when you point the two fingers at your eyes like look at me, look at me. <laughs> he started doing that, and it's just like fucking hell, like yeah, <laughs> Jeez, don't want to piss that guy off. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. seeing as as you visited the um, uh, twin American epicenters of the pizza world. Oh yeah. So the the traditional New York slice. Versus the oh. the uh, Chicago and deep dish, deep where, dish. Where's your vote? Well, so first off, let me shall I just paint a picture of what each of them are like? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. For anyone who don't know, so so the I start with Chicago. It's sort of easier. The Chicago pizza is not a pizza. It's a pie made out of pizza ingredients. <laughs> it's so it is literally like pie crust in a pie tin. And then they put, like, cheese on the bottom. Weird. Like, not on the bottom, like, underneath. But, like, <laughs> that'd be weird. <laughs> Just stick to the pan. <laughs> no, like, cheese on the base. And then they put the tomato sauce on and then whatever toppings and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then they bake it for, like, 40 minutes. Mm. So, so it's, it's a quiche. It's a, it's a, it's an eggless it's, quiche. Yeah, it's a quiche. Yeah. The New York pizza... And I had this as a slice because, you know, it's the New York slice. Mm, folded between the uh, fingers. Exactly. It's more like a pizza in the traditional sense. It's like, it's big. It's basically too big to support itself. So when you get this slice, the end just... <laughs> the doctor you know, said the same thing structure. about me. 
<laughs> so it sort of like starts flopping, drooping at the end. So that's why you need to fold it sort of along its long axis. You fold it <laughs> yeah. into like, and then it holds itself its shape better. Yeah, and it's more like a traditional pizza. It's more like, um, it's like let's say it's not a crispy base, but it's semi crispy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not quite a Neapolitan like sourdough. It's not quite a proper crispy. So those are the two. Honestly, from my experience, I preferred the um, the New York slice. And I also recommend heartily, if you're ever in New York, Bleecker Street Pizza, which is unsurprisingly on Bleecker Street <laughs> down in... Uh, I mean, I don't know the areas exactly. We'd gone through... It wasn't that far from Chelsea, but I don't think it is Chelsea. I think you're in somewhere else. But it's on Bleecker Street, but that's a massive road. But you basically head south. And so this place went in. It was it had pictures of celebrities on the wall. Uh, Russell Wilson was there. And the big one that I recognised was Hugh Jackman. So, you know, there you go. I've eaten the same food as Hugh Jackman. Uh, not literally saying that'd be disgusting. <laughs> but yeah, the owner was there. And he, despite the fact that apparently this pizza was good enough for Hugh Jackman, he really wanted to sell me on his pizza. And he was going on about how great it was. The pizza in question is called the Nona Maria. <laughs> and as he told me, it's from five generations of, from Tuscany, Italy. And I mean... For all non-Americans, that's, that's pronounced Tuscany. Yeah, well, this is where, like, I thought it was brilliant. Uh, and like I say, I really recommend this place. But it did kind of make me laugh because the more, like, he sort of burnished his Italian credentials the less authentically Italian it sounded. <laughs> yeah. But the more authentically Italian-American that's, it sounded. And that's what you're after. Which, and they're like, they're kind of distinct things. Yeah. Like, I know, like, Italian-Americans probably don't like to hear this, but, like... <laughs> you're not Italian. They, they are very not. <laughs> yeah. They might have an Italian, like, parent or grandparent yeah. or something. <laughs> they would stick out like a sore thumb in Italy itself. Yeah. Well, it, like, well, it's, it's like, that, like that bit in... <clears throat> The Sopranos, when they actually go to Italy and they can't eat any of the food because it's like, where's all the pizza and the pasta? It's like, oh no no, we've got like fresh mackerel straight from the sea and and, fe- <laughs> and feta and olives. And they're like, what the fuck is this shit? <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it would be like that. But yeah. I say this pizza, like say, non a marina, was, was really the, <laughs> non a Maria. <laughs> <laughs> She was from too skinny. <laughs> but how many generations? <laughs> Five generations of two skins. Of two skins. <laughs> two skins. <laughs> um, no, they're not the no. desert people from Star Wars. Uh, I'm, I'm in one of those things that's like, I don't know if they have a Twitter or anything. I'm like, do we tag them in this? Because on the one hand, we have mocked basically their heritage <laughs> and everything. <laughs> But on the other hand, it was genuinely like great pizza, and like I would like it's a type of place to say go there for your authentic like New York, you know, vibe mm. and delicious pizza. And if it's good enough for Hugh Jackman, like who the hell are you to to complain? Exactly, celebrities they just know better than us. Exactly. If, if there's one, if there's any sort of tenet I live by, it's that rich, beautiful people can do no wrong <laughs> well the the last like five years of the me too movement must have been really like <laughs> philosophically earth shattering for you <laughs> oh kevin spacey so, he was so good in house of cards actually that just reminds me like, uh, you know like not to go on my soapbox or whatever but it you know, like the whole me too movement but also like the wider thing of just celebrities and actors being dicks but get in the way of it because people are like, oh, but they're so talented. Like, I've never seen, I'm not like, obviously acting is a talent and a skill, but I feel like the sort of, right, once you're in the realms of like good professional actors, so obviously ignoring all like the shite that you see on like, you know, soaps and, and even below that, like amateur actors, Mm-hmm. and all that yeah. like you know once you get to like the certain level of skill it takes I feel like the gap between the top and the bottom is narrow enough that like I just don't understand why people always like kept putting up with these massive dickheads yeah 
you know like when you hear like stories and it's like oh yeah so there was I don't know let's let's just say uh, well let's oh, not oh, use a name but uh, like let's just let's just say actor John Smith and they're like yeah so he turned up to late uh, turned up to set like four hours late every day. He was rude to all the staff. He was a nightmare to work with, and he'll keep getting cast because he's just he's just a phenomenal generational talent. And you're like, is he worth it though? Yeah. Like, okay. how much worse would the film be if you just got another competent actor who, who, who isn't was a nice. dickhead? Yeah. Yeah. No. Oh, definitely. It's. Like, it, I've always wondered, it, like, why did why did they get so much slack sometimes? Because I'm like. Yeah, I know the Oscars are all about like the best actors and stuff, but like there's quite a few Oscar winning performances that still could have been done by someone else. Yeah. And like you know well, what I'm trying to say is like, yeah. All right, let's just say Johnny Depp. I know like he's got the whole did he do something, did he not? Like and I don't know what he was like on set or whatever. I'm not saying him specifically. Oh, uh, how, how about He's uh, great. How but about- Daniel Day Lewis, also great. Would like yeah, and apparently you know, a nice guy. Having to swap them, yeah, like in any situation, would you get like a huge drop off? Yeah. Or even the other way around, let's say Daniel Day Lewis was a massive dickhead and you had to put Johnny Depp in something. Perfectly competent actor. I'm sure most films, I know like Daniel Day Lewis is like the greatest or whatever. Most films, you'd probably still be like, oh, yeah, he did a perfectly good performance there. Huh? <laughs> like. I mean, I don't know. I, I just feel I, like nobody's a bit. I a hundred percent get your point. I don't think. All right, not necessarily Daniel Day Lewis and oh. Johnny Depp. Okay, because I, like... I was going to say that, like, I don't know if I want Johnny Depp in. There will be blood. Possibly not. No, but what I mean is, like, once you get into the realms of decent actors, why are there so many? Like, yeah, I don't know. Some of them just seem to get away with so much, and you just think like. I'm sure somebody else could have given like as good of a performance without making everybody want to kill themselves. <laughs> and uh, like particularly when it's it's such like a it literally is a film that like you've got so many choices for, you know, like Jared Leto's apparent behavior in the uh in Suicide Squad. Oh, and, Suicide you're, and, Squad. and you're like for Suicide Squad really you're going to be that much of a dick yeah. to your fellow cast members <laughs> for Suicide yeah. Squad? Like it's not yeah, it's it's not it. it's not like Phantom Thread. It's not all like Schindler's List. It's not like some big high art piece. You're doing this for like a sort of superhero like compilation film, yeah. really? Okay. Yeah, that's that's it. It's like I don't know. I just feel like sometimes people like mythologize. Mythologize. That's the word. <laughs> like the art of acting, or and it's the same with other things like musicians as well. And stuff, and a lot of the time you just think like, why is everybody putting up with you? Because like, I, you're yeah. quite, you're good, but then mm. like you're also like, I don't know. I just feel like pretty much nobody in any field has ever been irreplaceable when they're like that much of a dick. Yeah, hundred percent. Like, yeah, I, I, I can I, understand why it's like, all right, this person isn't very fun to be around, but they're really talented, so we'll do it. It's like. Well, this person is literally a sexual predator, but we've let them get away with it because they think they're good at pretending to cry. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, like tear sticks exist. Yeah, it's mad. Yeah. Anyway, on that note, <laughs> shall we? Uh, <laughs> so to, let's get on with the show. In conclusion, no, New York pizza, good. <laughs> yeah, New York pizza, good. Um, asshole, celebrities, bad. <laughs> good, 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 like moral... Uh, Setting the parameters. And to tie it all together, Hugh Jackman, always good, enjoys New York pizza. <laughs> good. In, in, in Jackman we can trust. So, Chris, over to you for your one and only topic. So, for my topic, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start off with a question, and it might play into your uh, recent travels, but, um, Chris, when is the time in life you felt most out of your depth? Oh, every day. Just, just swimming, swimming against yeah, uh, swimming against the tide like a salmon yeah, without uh, fins, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> hoping not to get noticed, yeah, hoping not to get my head smashed in by a bear. Uh, I don't know. Um, there's a lot. I mean, one recent time that immediately <laughs> springs to mind was um, when I did that comedy news quiz, uh, Matt Harvey's comedy news quiz thing with uh, oh yeah, three 
actual comedians, including <laughs> yeah. including ITV's <laughs> Beck Hill, who, you know, yeah. somebody you yourself has paid actual money to go and see. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I'm just... And you. <laughs> yeah, and it's just like, <laughs> and me. <laughs> like, yeah. like when they were all plugging themselves, at the, you know, like Matt was like, all right, go on, guys, you know. He was plugging his uh, Melbourne Fringe show and yeah. upcoming or like you know, like sort of like world, world worldwide like comedy festival yeah, shows um, like I said yeah. there was uh, John as well he John Creasy he was he's got his uh, you know his werewolves live thing which has had like you know proper well known comedians and stuff appear on his on his show game thing Beck Hill was talking about you know and New, well, actually, she couldn't, but she, because she was hinting at the fact she was had a new TV show coming up, but she couldn't say anything. And I was like, "What are you doing?" I was like, "Well, my name's Chris. Um, I, I have a, I do, I do this podcast." <laughs> Yeah. It's like if you got a mate. surname. Nope, nope, nope. Do you have any sponsors? Nope, no, no surnames. <laughs> any big shows? No. Nope. <laughs> Any famous? Any live performances? N- n- never, no, no, I'd never, never ever. I'd, I'd never ever do that. Do you ever show you it? No, no. I just keep. <laughs> what about your real last name? Nope. I like to keep things, you know, anonymous, <laughs> just in case anybody from my real life yeah. work or ever found out about <laughs> yeah. this, and all of a sudden they realised I was a fucking moron. I felt, I felt pretty out of death then. <laughs> yeah, no, that is absolutely fair. Um, let's see how it compares to uh, the story I'm going to tell you about for my topic. It's the story of a man called Dembe. Uh, a Japanese merchant who, in 1701, he was on the crew of a of a ship in a fleet of 30 ships travelling from one port city to another in Japan. But there was a, a big storm and the fleet got blown massively off course and it eventually crashed into the coastline of the Russian peninsula of Kamchatka, uh, which is the very ne- uh, northeast part of Russia. It's a little peninsula off Siberia and which you know isn't ideal and most of the the ships were destroyed and most of the, the crew drowned but a few remaining survivors washed up onto shore and were found by a, a russian explorer called vladimir atlasov i think um and he was a siberian cossack and an explorer and he was the first russian to like explore all of this peninsula so he was sort of I don't know whether he like personally found them on the beach while taking his dog for a walk or whatever, but I guess they found him and brought him them to the the main dude there. Mm-hmm. Basically, like he sort of took care of them and nursed them back to health, but there weren't many of them left, and sort of through broken, you know, sort of translations back and back and forth, Dembe and the other survivors were like, "Please just send us back to Japan." Mm-hmm. But even if they'd been allowed to leave, then. Um, at the time, Japan had those um, Sakoku laws. The you know, like the they had like a isolationist policy at the time. I thought that was just. I mean, I say I thought that was just as if I had any sort of. My brief knowledge of it was that foreigners were banned from. I think they could be executed on site, apart from in like Nagasaki or somewhere. Yeah, so they couldn't do, do trade, but I think also that like Japanese citizens who left Japan, oh, weren't allowed. even like weren't allowed back. Okay. Um, so even though they just got like washed out to sea, then they they still weren't allowed back. So and they just pretended that they this... never left. <laughs> yeah, I, I, <laughs> I mean, like you just turn up with your ship and they go like, "Where have you been?" You just like. Just out to ships, sea. Yeah. Oh, where have you been? You just be yeah. like, "Well, I went the other way first. I went the long way round, <laughs> you see. I was bored. So I thought, rather than yeah. just sailing straight from this port to that port, I thought if I go all the way around the islands, just kill a bit of time. Yeah. Never left Japan, though. <laughs> nope, definitely not. That is a good point. That did not come up in the, the history. But anyway, I, I guess that was, that'd be hypothetical, even if they were allowed to leave. But like, not that they were kept prisoner, but I think they were nursed back to health. And then... um this dude, uh, Atlasov, decided uh, we'll take them all the way to St. Petersburg. That's a long way. That is a trek. I feel like that needs some contextualising for people who haven't quite grasped is where St. Petersburg is compared to that part of Russia. It is crossing an entire um, continent. Yeah. Um, St. Through... Petersburg is <laughs> as far west in Russia as you can get, pretty much. Yeah. 
it's like and this is as far east, east as you can get and russia is it, the largest country on the planet by quite a bit <laughs> so that's yeah, a long it, cause, that's a long walk <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I assume they had like you know like carriages and horses and stuff. But even so, you know the so so Kamchatka, this this peninsula is, it's it's pretty damn close to Japan, mm. um, you know, sort of globally speaking. So, yeah, Im- imagine you know you travel from essentially Japan to like basically Europe. Yeah. Um, and it's such a long journey that by the time they got there, that uh, Dembe was the only surviving member of the crew because everyone else wasn't exactly like fighting fit when they started off. And and it's it's a hell of a call to make to go. Well, you know these guys uh, washed up, so I need to check in with the old uh, supervising manager. Let's just uh, spend years <laughs> tricking across. And at that point, you know, sort of on there wasn't exactly the road of bones re- leading all the way through Russia, so it's, you know, through wilderness, mm-hmm. assumed, you know, pursued by bears. But they, they eventually did get to um, uh, St... Well, he did, mm-hmm. him and, and his, his Russian uh, sort of uh, escorts, and they went right to the big man. Uh, they, they said, right, we'll take you to go see Peter the Great. Oh, and, he's quite a big man. Yeah, so he's... Uh, he's uh, you can see why he's already feeling out of depth. Mm-hmm. You know, he's 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 learnt some rudimentary Russian from his from his I assume quite long <laughs> yeah. travels with, with with his actually probably fluent. Yeah, it's got several, <laughs> several years long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he's he's gone on a wild Lord of the Rings with a fellowship of Russian <laughs> Cossacks and, and brought them to the the Russian Gandalf. You know, that's you know you've gone right to the uh, the, the absolute CEO. And they were like, hey, we found this guy. He's from uh, a country that we're not allowed to go to. And he's like, okay, cool. Tell me everything you know about uh, Japan. And this guy was like a fisherman and a merchant. So it's not like he could tell them about like high society or like <laughs> the emperor or Japanese politics or like military strategies, like nothing that is of <laughs> any consequence. So, But he could tell them about what, clothes people were what they made their houses out of you know what uh, what they what people eat you know like tell, the price he get <laughs> could go in great detail about all the different types of fish yeah but i mean uh, from a trading point of view that might make sense like oh we we want more fish do they want silver or mm. copper or stuff like that so th- this guy who is so completely out of his depth, brought all this way and has no more Japanese like countrymen with him. So Peter the Great goes, right, okay, well he seems like a smart enough bloke. We'll um we'll set him up um at the Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg and his new title is Father of Japanese Language Education of Russia. Wow, well, that, that's quite and a And this guy is made <laughs> Yeah. So they they go, Okay, right, you are now uh, in charge of teaching Russian students Japanese, if they want to learn. You are the sole and undisputed source of of the Japanese language and how to how best to translate from Japanese into Russian. And he was like, I do, do I really have a, a choice in this? He's like, no, absolutely <laughs> not. I'm Peter the Great. He goes, okay, guess I'm an academic scholar now. And he lived the rest of his life in St. Petersburg um, teaching Japanese to... Uh, Russian students. I suppose he um, taught he, what he wanted, though. He's the only Japanese man in Russia. And those got contradicted. Yeah, yeah. It's like there are no books. There's no. It's he might have spoken broken Japanese or like a weird, like not you know, like a. No, I was gonna say like like if he wasn't particularly like well versed in oh. like Japanese poetry or you know or like if he had like uh, a weird accent, mm-hmm. then that's just what they learn, I guess. Yeah. He uh, eventually was. Uh, baptized, he was like brought into Russian Orthodox Christianity and uh, baptized, and he took the name of Gabriel, oh, yeah. and and then like sort of um, British uh, sort of um, explorers who like came to Russia, like uh, have like you know contemporaneous accounts of sort of visiting you know the sort of glittering jewel of Russia in Saint Petersburg and being like, yep, j- just a Japanese guy here, <laughs> that's, that's cool, I guess. Um, and what what's interesting is that just because of this of this one thing, so um, Atlasov, who was the guy who found him originally and brought him all the way there, because he'd been exploring this peninsula, but he'd sort of been doing it with himself and like his crew of of you know men or whatever. Mm-hmm. 
that he wanted funding to you know sort of like properly like explore it you know like do organized set up like trade route stuff like mm-hmm. that and he'd never really had much success but because of this guy then peter the great was like okay so there's there's stuff there it's it's worthwhile I, i'm going to like fund or you know give give give, uh, give him what he needs to fully like map out Kamacha and and sort of invested in uh, attempting you know sort of open up trade with japan and they, they didn't until the the sort of isolationist laws ended but uh, the uh, you know was that the the Meiji restoration i think mm. was that after the edo uh, empire so. ended or the edo dynasty edo I period i don't know yeah that's, that's it the e- edo period yeah weirdly there seems to be one of the few cuz con- considering japan's not that big i mean it's quite big but like compared to say china you know, it's not like a huge country. They managed to make isolationism. They were, still had like plenty of goods worth trading and stuff, and were considered like a lucrative land. Mm. To I don't, I don't know how people knew that when they weren't like very sort of open about it. <laughs> but either way, they've, the, just got, they've just got great PR. Yeah, either way, the Americans were like, "Look, you're going to start trading with us, or we're going to blow the shit out of your city." And they went. Mm. We have absolutely nothing to compete with that. <laughs> like, yeah. America's gone through like the Industrial Revolution and built like massive warships, and they're just like, "Yeah, we we haven't." And so yeah. they're like, "Right, looks like we're going to let foreigners in or die." Yeah, because I, I think the same. There was a, a, again another restriction, and then uh, after World War Two, they did the same thing. It's like part of the uh, surrender, you know, negotiations was like almost unlimited trade with America. Yeah. Probably. Well, I don't know the thing, but it sounds about right. But what was interesting as well, mm. going back to Russian Soviet, uh, Russian Japanese relations, is so famously what happened was Japan, so this was like 1860s or something like that. Japan went from like not having gone through the Industrial Revolution and being like isolationist to being like, right, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it properly. Took in. Like loads of like, yeah, you know, they use this trade and stuff to like develop technology and stuff. And basically, I think they even hired like Brits and Americans and French or whatever. Um, I'm pretty sure they hired like Brits specifically, but I can't remember. To be, you know, it was like consultants and to be like, right, you've gone through the Industrial Revolution. How do you build a factory or whatever? What do you need? And then mm. took all on board so much and so fast that like early 1900s. They got in a dispute with Russia, probably about a similar territory to the one you've been talking about, you know, that bit of Russia near Japan. And then Russia mm. were like, oh, yeah, we'll steamroll these guys. They only, like, you know, we've got warships and stuff. We went through the Industrial Revolution, like, a century ago. They went through it, like, you know, they're still going through it. Like, we'll steamroll these guys. And then they lost. And then they yeah. were like, oh, shit. <laughs> like, the Japanese have gone from, like, zero to a 100 <laughs> in no time. And then, yeah, yeah, they became, like, the first Asian power to, like, handily defeat a European power. <laughs> and then that, yeah. and then they went on to, like, start invading China, which, like, obviously it's a complicated history and stuff. But, like, like I say, China's huge. <laughs> and, like, throughout most of history, you know, you would have put easily put your money on the Chinese to be the winner in that sort of thing. I guess in the long term yeah. they were. But, like, even in, like, you know, medieval times and earlier and stuff like China's always just been this gigantic like hub of like on the eastern side like well like eastern equivalent to the Roman Empire or whatever and like Japan is, was like just a like four well a few islands <laughs> he was going like and then my money's on the giant you know continent spanning superpower and then they were like nope we're really good at this ever, ever the uh, sort of like geographical underdog but and then Korea, I think, somehow got caught in the middle whilst doing its own thing and being its own thing. And yet, I don't fully understand. I think it's a very complicated thing to try and understand because it was like, Korea was like its own thing. But also it was a client of China. But also Japan was wanting whatever. Yeah, and it just ended up with like sort of freeway wars and stuff and vying for supremacy. It's just like, I think you could spend a long time trying to learn all the like complex things. And this is not the place not. to get nuance from. Well, what's also complicated, which you never really think about, is, well, some people may, but you know, like you look at a map now and you see, like, you know, North and South Korea used to just be Korea, 
like not mm. that long ago. But then like what well, you never sort of fully comprehend well like I mean again you never that's like a big <laughs> broad sweeping statement. It takes a little bit longer to sort of gen generalize understand is like Korea wasn't Korea. Korea was a bunch of people, you know, like, you know, hundreds of years ago, whatever, you know, mm. may have all spoken the same language, but was subdivided into kingdoms in the same way Britain yep. was Wales and Scotland and, you know, whatever, and then England, and then they all, you know, nowadays we're one country, but, you know, for centuries or whatever, we were, you know, like... Yeah, or, or Germany. Germ- G- Germany, a, a series of competing tribes. Yeah, exactly. Sort of unified by... a broadly Germanic language. Yeah, exactly. And then, like, China, you know, the maps weren't always the same. And then, like, in some countries as well, weren't the country we know today until weirdly recently. Like, Italy, everyone just goes, Italy, it's always been Italy. Like, look at it, it's like a nice, neat, like, it sticks out from the rest of Europe. It was clearly always one country. It's like, nope, they all spoke some version of Italian, but until, uh, again, I think 1860-something, it was like... 15 different countries like kingdoms or whatever you're like you know 1860s yeah, yeah, you're you know, like that wasn't that you know like height of the Victorian age you're like that wasn't actually that long ago for Italy to not have been yeah. a thing yeah it's it's you know uh, like a single digit generations yeah especially when you go like um, you know Italy is like you know if you say Italian stuff everyone can easily conjure up images of like what Italian means you know like not just the language but like the stereotype the cultures the everything you know you get a picture in your head of the boot and then ferraris and pizza and the nonna marina the nonna maria <laughs> the nonna maria you know what i mean like you yeah, instantly get like a full picture yeah. and you just go like yeah no until 1860 whatever like that wasn't a thing not unified <laughs> they might yeah. have all spoken some version of italian but even then they probably would have said like no nah, i don't speak italian i speak neapolitan it's like, is, yeah. I mean, is that's it if you, yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's it's thereabouts. Yeah, if you, you can go on, if you sit, like look at YouTube and and have you know like the world, the sort of modern world map of a like, but done in a timeline. Oh yeah, I've seen that. Like, it's good. like yeah, like it's you you you're you know seconds away from the end of the video before you get anywhere. You mm-hmm. know when you get to the, the modern. Yeah. Um. You know, and especially like European, you know, like yeah, people love to act like, like e- countries now as they are should never change their borders and stuff. And part of me is always like, well, they've changed a lot. Yeah, you look at Alsace, and it's been oh, yeah. French and German, and then Teutonic, and yeah, and like Vandals, and also when you look at a map, you of, know, like, like, the outline of Germany. Like you can yeah. fix that image yeah. in your it's, head. It's so modern. And then you look at yeah. like a pre World War One, and it's just got these bits sticking out the side, and you're just like, "Wait, what? That's not Germany." But like World War One, German outline. And you know, like you say, include bits of France, bits of Poland. They they do. So yeah, if you if you feel out of depth, at least you're not a sort of uh, intergalactic cartographer who's constantly having to like re-edit. <laughs> Is a their um their thing, and at least you're not responsible for been the sole source of knowledge on your language and culture that's true you know sometimes it's just a a comedy news quiz exactly so with all of that let's have uh, your topic well funnily enough my first topic is also about somebody who uh, well you could say that they're out of their depth and trying desperately not to be so uh we have taught in the past about the chinese the big chinese exam it was one of your topics way back in one of the uh wow yeah that was like one earlier. of the first episodes yeah i can't remember what it was called you might be able to but uh was it the um was it the, uh, the one for going to the, university the the cow lu i think yeah top of my head and uh just as a recap it's very taken very very seriously um i think we were talking about that they had drones flying overhead to stop people cheating passing traffic was like like people could get fined if they honk their horns outside yeah. during exam times and stuff like that. Yeah, because they even like shut down roads and stuff so there wouldn't be distracting noise. Because it's like a life-defining exam, isn't it? So I think yeah. what we were talking about was a lot of pressure. Well, on a similar vein, uh, we'll talk about uh, Indian exam, which, from my understanding, has a similar. Le- they have similar levels of pressure 
on them. Um, that's again, they seem to be quite life defining. Yeah, both cultures that really push sort of academic, like hierarchies. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, I guess that's sort of like your ticket to a good job Uni and the and, rest of your yeah. yeah hangs on this. In I imagine in similar in China, like so these India ones, there were also some quite extreme attempts to cheat. Because when you have a lot riding on being smart, some people, unfortunately, are not as smart as they'd hope, and they attempt to cheat instead. And with the pressure on them, you can kind of understand it. If you've got one shot to uh, sort your your whole life out, you're going to uh, you'll do whatever you can. Um, there was a famous picture of parents climbing a um, up five floors from the outside to pass notes to their kids inside to help them cheat these exams once. Um, <laughs> which I feel like doesn't work. I feel like cheating only works if it's subtle. Whereas if you have an entire school's worth of parents handing notes through the window, like you got the, the invigilator is surely going to notice. And if they're not going to notice, <laughs> yeah, yeah. then you might as well have just walked in through the front door. Because if they're not going to notice <laughs> yeah. that, you, yeah. you know, the, you might as well. But anyway, uh, this is about a different exam. Um, it was a medical student who is, uh, they had to clear an exam. They'd got admitted into medical college, the uh, Mahatma Gandhi Memorial College. Uh, but they were, sorry, Memorial Medical College, sorry, because he's a doctor. And it's one of those we're living in the future moments because, you know, don't know if you've ever cheated in an exam, but, you know, traditional ways are maybe writing some answers hidden somewhere like up your arm and then roll your sleeve back. Maybe take a piece of paper in. I've heard of people putting a piece of paper in their shoe and they take their foot out of the shoe and they can see it. Um, you know, things like that. Obviously, we're in a bit more of a high-tech thing. I remember when, uh, I think, smartwatches... I feel like smartwatches are... You. There must have been some very rudimentary shit smartwatches because I feel like Apple watches weren't around until... We were a bit older, but I'm sure when we were in school, they banned like certain type of watches because you could get text on them or something like that. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I had an iPod Touch at school, so I don't know if I'm the best barometer for that because I don't think... I think an iPod Touch was quite good when we were at school, though. In fact, I think it was only in... I think iPhones had only just come out as we were sort of in our last years. But anyway. Yeah, true, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, these are like the more technical ways now people like say smart watches or whatever. Well, a medical student who was on his 11th year trying to do this exam, which is a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. And this was his final, final chance Yeah. to do it. I don't know, actually, the way it's written, it says like he's repeatedly failed the exam since getting admitted to the college 11 years ago. And this was his final attempt. I don't know if this is like... Because the way it's written, it's not clear. Because presumably, if he's been admitted to college, you don't need to pass this exam to get in. And if it's 11 mm. years, part of me wonders if this is like his final year exam or something. You know, like... The first end of year exam to progress to the next bit. And yeah. like, he, he's bit got in, but he keep, he's yeah, not getting he's been any in first year for 10 years. Which, I mean, yeah. I feel like he should have less chances than that. Because 11 years is a long time. Um, yeah. <laughs> I feel like if you've not got it after three years, you're probably just not going to get it. Mm. But yeah, this guy was so desperate. He um, got a, he put a Bluetooth uh, headset in his ear so somebody could give him the answers. But you might think like, oh, that's not too like interesting. He's just got a little Bluetooth earbud. Like, that's not that interesting. To avoid detection, and it obviously didn't work, he got a doctor to surgically implant a flesh-coloured earbud into his ear. Jesus Christ. Yeah. So it doesn't say what the uh, the actual plan was, but he reportedly had a skin-coloured micro-Bluetooth device fixed in his ear by an ENT surgeon. Who had passed the exam. Presumably. To pass. Yeah. yeah. Well, the idea was you'd be told to hand in all the electronic devices, and you're like, ah, yeah, well, if he's got that, stitched into his ear. It's a very sort of a cyberpunk type of yeah. cheating. In fact, and it turned, there was another student as well, So, but his was apparently a bit more detachable because you could take it out with a pin, whereas the other guy, I think, needed proper surgery. They were both Ugh. surgically 
touched in some part anyway. And and did he pass the exam or was well, he Well, he was caught beforehand. Apparently one of them had a phone in their pocket and they found that it was connected to a Bluetooth device and then they got suspicious and then they started looking and then they found it in his ear. <laughs> they flayed everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I mean the, the, the thing is, like, with any sort of like, the, the more like wacky the scheme to cheat, the more I immediately think the amount of time and effort you spent on this, you could have just been studying. Yes, there is always that, but we love shenanigans. Oh, oh yeah, like we'd we'd run out of topics without them, so we're grateful for these weirdly prioritized lunatics. Yeah. Um, but like, there was a kid at my Chinese uni who. He had, like, uh, all the characters, Chinese characters that he couldn't remember, he printed them out on, a on like, on tiny, tiny font, but to make it look like the sort of nutritional value of a, of a water bottle, <laughs> and then put it to the, the thing. And I'm like, it was, it was really, really convincing. And then, but one, you've got to, like, get away with, like, looking at this tiny print intently, well, or not looking yeah. like you're just scanning the water bowl. But it's also like the time it took to like do that, just study a bit more. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what happens when you've got too much pressure on some exams, I guess. I, I, I don't know if I've just been that passionate about anything for like no. 11 years solidly. I like, especially know, like yeah, 11 academics. Years, like I say, I've, like, I think, like, like you go, two or you go three to years when I you're 18. You've got to do. Yeah. And if at twenty nine you're still sat there going, this time, teacher, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna nail well, this it. This is time. the thing, especially like because it's not clear what year he was in. So he might have passed this and still have another like four years to go. And he's yeah. only gonna have to do it again because presumably each year gets harder. So then, so oh, then so next year, did they have to put like Bluetooth blockers in the classroom, <laughs> or did it escalate? In- attach them to people's heads. <laughs> yeah. We'll play them at their own game. <laughs> Wait till like they start doing these brain chips that they're looking into, and just download the answers off the internet. Augmented reality like lenses. Yeah, well, imagine like if you just downloaded the answers off the internet, and all of a sudden you just sort of like you're like when you Google something. Sometimes you'll get really good answers, and sometimes it won't quite know what you mean. So you just get some random tangential shit mm. that has some yeah. of the right words, but in none of the right context. <laughs> you just end up with like. Absolutely- I've noticed more and more Google is so like quick. Just to, it like picks the word it doesn't like and just crosses it out. And you've got to go. No, you must include this word. It's like, well, I've not got anything for that. I'll just I'll just give you like three out of your four keywords. What winds me up a little bit is when you're searching for something. You know when like something has, say, there's a name of a film, but it's just a generic word. Say, so like you're looking for uh, like cars. Say you just Googled cars, <laughs> it would yeah. come up instead with the Pixar film. Oh, and yeah. you're like, I mean, that's a bad example because like, you wouldn't just Google the word cars. But like, you know when it's something like that and you're like, it comes up with the film and stuff first and you're like, come up with that later. Like, Have that as like your second or third. I'm just trying to find... Like, yeah, I want generic Google images of cars, please. Yeah. yeah. Or like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, say you Googled New York and it just comes up with like the song New York by... Alicia Keys and you're just like like if I want that I'll put in New York something like give me New York yeah. first and <laughs> no, then no, tell I want, me about I want the song called New York by yeah. Paloma Faith also I feel like the internet peaked about like 2012-ish maybe about then I feel like the internet peaked it got to this stage maybe a couple of years after so obviously early internet day well obviously super early internet days it was probably just a nightmare where nothing worked but you know like say early 2000s the internet you could get things but it was a pain in the ass. you'd have to go past the first page in Google a lot of the time to find stuff YouTube was rubbish quality and whatever 10 minute lengths videos and all that and I feel like you got to like 2012-ish 2014-15 and like the internet was just peaked Everything was super fast. YouTube was like HD, full length things. No ads. <laughs> no, yeah, known to few ads. And if there were ads, they weren't too annoying. Yeah, it'd oh, be yeah, like that was one well. skippable one no right pop- at the beginning. Like, remember in the early days of the internet, like pop up to a nightmare telling you've won a yacht or whatever, and <laughs> yeah. spam and all that. And then, like, got to a point where they disappeared. And, like, YouTube used to just, like, you'd turn on the thing on YouTube, it'd go full HD straight away, and it would start like, now, I swear, 
I got to a certain couple of years, whatever, of that peak, it went back downhill again. All of a sudden now, you go on any website and you've got to navigate through like 10 pop-ups of them being like, do you want to sign up for our newsletter? No. GDPR. We, okay. <laughs> Cookies. Yeah, we, value, we value your privacy. Well, fuck, you're not doing a very good fucking job of it. Yeah. And he's just there. you got to click through all these things. Register for this website. No. Yeah, sign and then you Google. get there. No. Then all of a sudden there's like more adverts than there ever seemed to be before. Then And they're yeah. now not even pop-ups. They don't have the decency to be pop-ups. you got to wait for them to load because they're part of the page. YouTube now seems to no matter how fast your internet is, you've just, it just always seems to take ages to go. And you know, like back in the day, you know, when things used to buffer, you used to pause it, mm. let it buffer a bit, and then you could press play, you know, it would interrupt. Whereas now it doesn't do that. It always seems to be like, no, nah, no, nah, just buffer like the millisecond to go. Like it's more efficient that way and then always catches up and gets stuck. <laughs> and it's like, you do your internet test and it's like faster than it's ever, it's like 100 megabit a second. You're like, this is the fastest internet by far I've ever had. Why is everything slower? That's my rant yeah. on the internet anyway. We're going backwards. It'll be dial up again soon. There is a strange nostalgia for those horrifying noises. Oh yeah. Robots screaming. That was the only way to... <laughs> I imagine telling people that. It like, could kids with a machine like, god. Yeah. Yeah, we used to uh, use the internet, but the only way was nobody in your house would be allowed to use the phone and you'd have to listen to it, robots screaming for a second first. And not only that, but the computer was a big bulky thing in a room oh, designated yeah. for the computer. Like, I'm going in the computer room. Yeah, those were the days. They were days. But I think these days we've gone wildly off topic, so I think it's time for the outro. <laughs> I forgot we were still recording them. We're just, just having a good old natter about the good old days. And so, on that note, it's time for us to bid thee farewell. We great underachievers out of our depths in the world. We are... Uh, nah, I think, I think Chris, me and you, we're right where we need to be. Middling along in a moderately successful podcast. Not too much pressure. Yet the parapet untroubled by our heads. Exactly. Yeah, we're not we're not going to be troubling uh, Joe Rogan or um, Harry and Meghan or anything for Spotify's next hundred million dollar pod podcast uh, contract. But you know we're we're doing all right. We've uh, we have our loyal fan base, which who we appreciate dearly, and um, they don't expect too much from us, which seems us just <laughs> fine. Yeah, that, that's the thing. It's like if we had a hundred million dollar contract. I'm like, oh, I don't, don't really want to record this week, or like, oh, sorry, I'm working. Like, it's like, uh, it's just that Mate, got, uh, if we if we had a hundred million oh, yeah. dollars, I'm not fucking working. Oh yeah, good point. Why am I still working? <laughs> I just like the ambience of emails. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's an excellent point. Like, what am I doing with my time? If yeah. you're just there, just back stacking shelves in a. Uh, <laughs> supermarket yeah. and no, no, people no, are like no, no, why are you here no, and you're no, just no. like I just enjoy the cans <laughs> <laughs> I just like turning all the cans around so they face the same way Heinz like... Heinz Heinz <laughs> ooh Branston you naughty devil <laughs> Heinz Heinz right okay well that's my shift done I only work for four minutes I'm gonna get in my Ferrari fuck all y'all yeah. it's like why haven't you fired him yet because he's worth a hundred million dollars oh the dream so the dream <laughs> <laughs> so the low low dream we'll be back again in a couple of weeks with yet more interesting facts sometimes like today they're accidentally almost on a theme and sometimes they're wildly disparate and we have to tonally <laughs> mash them together <laughs> like Frankenstein yeah. monster yeah. and one of us gone heavy whimsy and one of us <laughs> gone like quite sad yeah. and we're just there like, like well oh, yeah, here's a story about like you know misery in a war and it's like oh well, I'm doing the thing about cats with funny tails. <laughs> it's always the person doing the outro that has to stitch it together. So it's like, well, from uh, the Armenian genocide to Little Whiskers' big adventure, that's <laughs> yeah. certainly a that's to today. tonal shift from Cooking with Grief. Oh, sorry, that just reminds me, actually. One off-topic thing going? before we wrap this up. No, American news is something I noticed. They do cliffhangers. And I'm just like... It's the news. You're, you're the news. <laughs> like, it was about a car crash. And it turned out that the driver... Like, it was a deadly car crash, big pileup. And it turned out, like, the child... Like, the driver of one of the cars was only a 13-year-old kid. 
who obviously shouldn't be, you know, yeah. I know we discussed American driving <laughs> but laws and stuff, but... but, but they're yeah. an exception. Yeah. No, but, like, 13-year-olds not allowed to drive. Yeah. Even, like, no matter what. But the way it was framed on the... I can't remember what news channel it was. I don't think it was CNN. I think it was a different one. But anyway, they went, coming up next, the story of a... And bear in mind, this, is a, this wasn't, like, an old news thing. This was, like, a... Um, it had happened like earlier that day, I think, or the day before. So, you know, it was current. They were like, coming up later, we'll be looking after the break, the store, you know, the pile up on I 95 with less six dead, and how the driver behind the wheel of one of the cars shouldn't have been behind the wheel at all. I'm like, it's like wow. It's- I was like, you've just done a trailer voice. <laughs> yeah. Seg- like, yeah, in, in the lead out into the into in the, the in the UK break. that 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 would be, <laughs> uh, be like, uh, a thirteen year old boy was <laughs> yeah. killed because he was driving a car. <laughs> yeah, and now like you just you just factually say yeah. it like with do do a fucking without, build up. And... But with it, with, do they do it with other stuff? It's like looking ahead to the seven day forecast. We're looking at sunny spells, but some of these temperatures might shock you. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I don't know. I was just a bit like. Come yeah. on, you're, you're, you're <laughs> you, discussing you, the death of like yeah. a thirteen-year-old kid. Like you don't need to do a fucking like. Yeah, it's it's like, it's, it's, it's not meant to be like, compelling. It's meant to be informative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Ugh. I just found that a bit mad. I say I can't remember which. It wasn't Fox News, and I don't think it was CNN, but I can't remember which. I want to say it was like NBC, CNBC, whatever it is. Oh right, but I can't. I can't. God, they love an acronym. Put that for definite. Give me the oh, B- they do. give me the BBC any day. <laughs> <laughs> no acronyms at the BBC. <laughs> no, no, just book. <laughs> All right. And on that note, it's goodbye from us here at CWG. <laughs> oh, yeah, good point. <laughs> yeah, excellent point. Goodbye. Join us again. We will find some facts you won't believe. I mean, that makes sense because they've got to wait two weeks for the next episode. Like, an actual, like, we should have been doing... <laughs> And we don't even know what the facts are going to be. <laughs> <laughs> that, that we might not really believe. Goodbye. Bye. And the home of the brave. Hi, I'm Eric. And I'm Aisla. And together we are the hosts of the Bicurian podcast. Bicurian is our answer to the polarizing culture we live in. Tired of feeling under siege and looking for ways to get involved? Then come be a part of a different way of thinking. Everything from politics, to geek culture, to current events that polarize us as a society. We explore multiple ways of looking at things. Please check us out at Bicurian.com and follow us on your favorite social media platform of choice.